Hello and welcome. Welcome book lovers. Welcome Jane Austen lovers. This is our first guided session of our reading together of Jane Austen's first published novel, Sense and Sensibility. It's so nice to have you here. Let me know if there's anyone live. Grab your cup of tea and let's have some Jane Austen fun. <laughs> so I see that Rain Love is live. Hello, Rain Love. Where are you speaking from? I am currently in the Netherlands, as you can tell from, from the cold. <laughs> and who else is live? Let me know um, why you are here and why you love Jane Austen. Hi, Rain Love is from Argentina. That's great. That's awesome. I'm actually from Brazil originally, so it's great to have a South American um, Jane Austen lover here. Uh, hi, Michelle here is from South Africa. Welcome, Michelle. Great to have you here. So Rain Love says that she's been living in Italy for uh, the past three months, so that's great. Uh, also in Europe then. Hi, Jenny. Oh, nice to see you again. Jenny was one of our students at the uh, Creative Reader Academy. Hi, Jenny. So nice to meet you all. Welcome to our first, like I said, welcome to our first live session of the guided reading of Jane Austen's Sense and Sensibility. Jenny's in the UK, yes, so the same place as our beloved Jane Austen. <laughs> so before we start, let me introduce myself to you. So my name is Fernanda Moura. I am a literary scholar, um, PhD in literary studies, and a literature teacher. I teach mainly 18th and 19th century English literature, and I'm passionate about the 19th century. I usually tell my students that if I could, um, if I could go on a time travel, if there were such a thing as a time travel machine. I would like to go back to the 19th century and most likely talk to Jane Austen to see what she was like. <laughs> um, so thank you for being here and for sharing this passion for uh, books, Jane Austen and 19th century literature with me. Um, I am also the founder of Books and Culture. Books and Culture is an online platform in which I offer online literature courses such as the Creative Reader Academy, an introduction to literary studies, um, of which Jenny was a part, um, and the upcoming The Jane Austen Club, which is a theme course on Jane Austen. I've been creating very interesting literary content. I've been reading a lot on Jane Austen to prepare very good content for you. So if you're interested to know more about uh, these courses, um, you should check out the website, booksandculture.club. Um, so no www, only booksandculture.club. Uh, um, so there you can find information about the courses and also you can sign up to the newsletter to be notified of upcoming, um, upcoming events, upcoming courses, and also get literary content uh, for me. Um, so, well... Jane Austen, let me get the microphone closer to me. Uh, so Jane Austen was one of my first literary passions. Um, and she was definitely the first, um, uh, let's say, serious academic research that I did. Um, I wrote my first thesis on Jane Austen and actually on Sense and Sensibility when I uh, finished my BA in English Language and Culture and Literature in 2014, 2014, yes. Um, I wrote specifically about the character Marianne Dashwood in Sense and Sensibility and about her sensibility as an act of subversion. But let's not get ahead of yourselves. We'll have time enough to go back to, to Marianne and to talk about her. Wonderful character by Jane Austen. Um, and she's been my passion ever since. Uh, so as I said, I usually teach 18th and 19th century English literature and the module on Jane Austen was always my favorite. So I decided why not um, 
take that knowledge, right, and share my passion, uh, share my um, expertise, let's say, on Jane Austen with a wider audience. So that's why I've decided to create the course, the Jane Austen Club, and also to start the series of live guided readings so we can explore the, um, uh, the work of Jane Austen together. Um, and starting with her first published novel, although not the first she wrote, we'll talk about that in a bit, uh, Sense and Sensibility. Um, so why do you love Jane Austen? I would love to know that. Let me know in the, in the comments. And in the meantime, I will explain to you how this project will work. So um, today is um, an introduction to the project. An introduction to the text. Let's say I'm going to talk a little bit about its publication history. And we're going to read together and discuss chapter one. And you can have any edition of uh, Sense and Sensibility. There are many, many, many on the market. Um, and since the, the novel was published over 200 years ago, it's also in the public domain. So you can easily find it um, online if you wish. Um, I will be working with this specific edition. It is the Cambridge edition of the works of Jane Austen. Uh, it's a thicker edition and I love it because, well, this one was edited by Edward Copeland, who is a specialist in Jane Austen. So there is a lot of extra material that is very uh, interesting. Uh, for instance, a very good um, introduction and very, sorry, very good footnotes. I'll be sharing some of this content with you, but you can follow along with any any edition you may have, any copy you may have at, in your home or um, at the library. Um, um, that's it, yes. And this is how it's going to work. So um, day two. So yes, we're going to meet every Thursday at 1 p.m. Central European time. Uh, this is when I'll be here live talking to you. But uh, if you cannot make it live at this time, that's absolutely fine. Uh, these sessions will be recorded as this one is being recorded at the moment. Um, so you can watch it at your convenience. And if you wish, you can always send me questions or comments beforehand so we can talk about it live, even though you cannot make it at that specific time. You can send me an email at um, hello at booksandculture.club. So I would love to, to hear from you. So next Thursday, day two, which is the 9th of February, we're going to be talking about chapters two to five. Um, so you can either read them in advance or you can um, read them with me. So uh, there are these two possibilities. And then the day after that, day three, and the 16th of February, we're going to read chapters 6 to 9, after that chapters 10 to 13. So each day we're going to, I mean, each week we're going to discuss four chapters, um, which, of course, it varies depending on the edition, but in my edition it is roughly 30 pages. So you will be reading, uh, we'll be reading together 30 pages uh, per week. After this live is finished, I will post the schedule on Instagram and on Facebook. So if you don't follow me yet, uh, you should follow me at books.end.culture, books and culture. Um, I will post the, um, the schedule there so you can um, uh, keep it, maybe write it on your agenda. I will also post it in our Facebook group. If you're not part of our Facebook group yet, let me know and I'll send you the link. Um, so let's see. I think that's all the practical information I needed to share with you today. And how do you feel about this project? I hope you are as excited as I am to dig deeper into the works of Jane Austen. Um, so I asked you, why do you love Jane Austen, right? Um, in my case, I feel like Jane Austen's novels are very heartwarming. And, um, and it's a window to the past. I am very passionate about the past, as I told you. In reading Jane Austen's novels, we get a glimpse at what life used to be like for a certain, of course, certain um, social classes. At the end of the 18th and beginning of the 19th century, the social conventions, um, 
social expectations, gender expectations. So I think that's very interesting uh, to do a window. Books are a window to the past, right? So, um, bookmarks always, right, to annotate the text. So we're going to read the text together and I encourage you to annotate it. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, um, there is an upcoming series called The Creative Reader Week in which I talk about annotation and also in the course, The Creative Reader Academy, there is one um, module on annotation and it's very important to really interact and engage actively with the text i can show you how i um how i annotate my text so i add comments on the margin and i add this kind of stickers to uh, point me to the places that i find more significant in the in the text and that i want to return to rain love says exactly that so you feel the same that jane austen is a uh, heartwarming uh, author and um, a window to the past. Jenny says, I have been looking forward to getting to read and discuss Jane Austen's books. I have not read Sense and Sensibility. But that changes today. We're going to start reading uh, Sense and Sensibility today. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about the, the history of publication, which I think is quite interesting. So although Sense and Sensibility was um, the first published book by Jane Austen in 1811. Um, it was not the first book that she wrote. And also the version that came out in 1811 is not the first, the original version that um, Jane Austen work in, that Jane Austen wrote. In fact, she worked on this manuscript for over 15 years. Uh, so the first version was finished around 1795. And it was called Eleanor and Marianne, and it was an epistolary novel. Now, do you know what it what is an epistolary novel? I know the Jenny knows. <laughs> yes, Rainlow says letters. An epistolary novel is one composed of entirely of letters or other documents, um, such as journal entries. Or if you think um, if you think of more modern texts, um, take a look at uh, Dracula by Bram Stoker, for example. There are also um, telegraphs, so um, uh, reports, trans transcriptions. Um, more even more now contemporary texts include emails or post-its. I've seen so um, entirely made up of. Um, materials like this. Eleanor and, Mar Eleanor and Marianne, the original version of uh, Sense and Sensibility, was entirely made up of letters, which was a very popular genre in at the end, mid, let's say, mid-18th century. Uh, think of Samuel Richardson, Pamela, for example, which is considered by some scholars to be one of the first uh, novels in English language. It was very, very um, uh, popular at the end of mid to the end of the 18th century because it offered a first-hand account of events and a, and a very private account of events because a letter is a private correspondence. So you as a reader has a glimpse into someone else's private document. So that was quite exciting and enticing for uh, 18th century readers. But by the turn of the 19th century, epistolary novels were not that, that um, famous anymore. In fact, they were getting really outdated. So, uh, so Jane Austen, see, um, uh, saw, of course, was very. Um, she was very aware of the uh, literary tendencies of the time. She read a lot, um, so she changed it. So she rewrote the original uh, version, and she wrote. Uh, she changed the title to Sense and Sensibility in 1797, so not an epistolary form. So Jenny writes that she did not realize that Sense and Sensibility started off being letters. Yes, you will find a lot of letters um, within uh, Austen's works. Think of even as Sense and Sensibility or Pride and Prejudice, there are a lot of letters inside. Um, 
But as the trend in the literary market was changing, she also changed. So she revised the text. And by 1797, she had a complete different version. Um, and later, she revised it one more time in 1809, between 1809 and 1810, for publication. So then her goal, first, when she was um, younger, she wrote for fun, but with, with that little ambition or hope for becoming a writer but in 1810 she really had that goal in mind so she revised the manuscript with the purpose of getting it published and it was accepted by the publisher Thomas Egerton in the winter of 1810 and finally it was published on 30th of October 1811 so the first uh, published novel uh, so Edward uh, Copeland, the editor of this book, he writes about this um, publication history of Sense and Sensibility, and he writes that it's possible to see a mixture of Jane Austen's, let's say, in this text. So a combination of the young, more innocent, more naive, um, inexperienced writer with the more mature right of the 1790s, with the more mature writer um, from the 1810s. And also you can see different, um, uh, the, ef the effect of different contexts. So the 1790s was a very turbulent time in European, especially French and uh, English history. It was, of course, 1789, the French Revolution really turned things upside down. So the fall of the monarchy in, in France and the hope that it gave to uh, radicals all over the continent uh, to change things and to get power in their own hands, in people's hands. Um, so that was in the 1790s, but by 1810s, the situation was different. Uh, and England, so this hopeful period uh, declined. You can see that with the Romantic poets as well. Um, and uh, by the 1810s, so in England, it was during the rule of George III, who was um, getting more mentally unstable, eventually deemed unfit to rule. Um, so um, Edward Copeland says that you can also see this different contexts playing out in Sense and Sensibility, although in Austen's works, the historical context is usually in the background. The focus is more on the inside, the domestic sphere, instead of the, the outside, what was going on, right? Um, but although Sense and Sensibility was the first book to be published, it was not the first book that Jane Austen offered for publication. Uh, so first, she offered First Impressions, which was the original title of which Jane Austen novel? First Impressions was the original title of which Austen book? P and P, <laughs> Pride and Prejudice. <coughs> so Pride and Prejudice's original title was First Impressions. And um, Jane Austen had offered the, the manuscript of First Impressions um, for sale, but it was refused by the um, Pride and Prejudice. Yes, Rain, Love and Gabriella uh, answered correctly. Very good. So it was offered for publication, but it was rejected in 1797. And also Susan, which was the first version and original title of which other book by Austen? Susan? This is a less known Austen novel. Um, so Susan was initially the title for uh, Northanger Abbey. And Susan was sold in the spring of 1803. So it was very exciting for Jane Austen because she had finally sold her first manuscript. But it was never published by uh, Richard Crosby, who had bought the, um, um, the, right, the copyrights of um, Susan. So it was uh, quite... 
painful in the beginning. It was not easy. It's never easy for anyone, not even Jane Austen. So she also um, suffered rejection, uh, anticipation, and finally in 1811. So that is, let me help me here. So from 1797 until 1811, around 15 years, let's say, she was waiting to become a published author. Oh, so Rain Love says she's learning a lot. Awesome. Great. I love hearing that. Uh, really, really good. So, um, Pride and I mean, Sense and Sensibility was sold. Uh, it was actually, so there were four ways that a writer could publish their work in the 19th century. One, um, publication at their own expense, so pay for everything. So you needed to have money in advance, which was not the case for Jane Austen. The other, publication by subscription, when uh, readers would pay um, to be uh, listed as the first readers and the subscribers of a specific text, that would work for people that had already an established name or had already published something before. So that would not work for Jane Austen, who was unknown at the time. Uh, subscription, I mean, uh, publication on commission and the sale of copyright and the sale of copyright. Uh, so the editors would take complete risk over uh, the sales. And that is very unlikely to happen for a first time writer. And that was not the case for Jane Austen either. So Sense and Sensibility was published on commission, which means that Jane Austen uh, paid for the costs beforehand and then was repaid after the, the book the books were sold um, with the help of one of her brothers. Um, so that is the contextual information I would like to share with you, the publication history of Sense and Sensibility. Um, before we dig into uh, the story itself, uh, I think it's always important to know where a book comes from and how it was, how it reached the market, um, putting a book in its context. And uh, that's what we're doing here today. So now let's move on to reading Sense and Sensibility. I would first... Oh, uh, wow. I would first like to show you the title page of the first edition of Sense and Sensibility, although here in this, I see that it is the second edition, and you will know how I know that. It says, Sense and Sensibility, I'm a novel in three volumes, very common in, um, in, in the Regency and Victorian period by the author of Pride and Prejudice. So by the time the second edition was out, Pride and Prejudice had already been published in 1813. Um, so this is not the first edition. But the first edition is, the title page of the first edition is pretty similar, except for here, the author, it says, by a lady. By a lady. So that's the author of Sense and Sensibility. It was published anonymously. All books by Jane Austen were published anonymously um, by, a, by a lady in the first edition of, Pride, of Sense and Sensibility and later on by the author or by the authoress of Sense and Sensibility, by the author of Pride and Prejudice. So her name never appeared in print during her lifetime. It was only uh, later that her name appeared in print after her death. All right, so let's get started with Sense and Sensibility. It's such, an, such a good, interesting book. And chapter one um, says a lot about, sets the tone, sets the scene, sets the context, and introduces the characters. So if you have your copy, take it with you, and let's read together chapter one. Um, if you don't have a copy yet, you can find... Uh, the whole text online, or you can just listen to me. I will stop every now and then to add some comments or some extra information. So let's see. Chapter one. The family of Dashwood had been long settled in Sussex. Their estate was large and their residence was at Norland Park in the center of their property. 
where for many generations they had lived in so respectable a manner as to engage the general good opinion of their surrounding acquaintance. Now, with these first lines of this first paragraph, Jane Austen already tells us something that is very important for this and other of her novels, which is respectability and reputation. So these characters and also the social uh, sphere in which Jane Austen herself lived with her family, so upper, upper class, upper middle class, uh, the gentry, they were very concerned with reputation and the respectability of a family name. It is important to keep your name and to keep your reputation. Otherwise, your social life would be ruined and the consequences financially, practically would be devastating. Um, so the Dashwoods were settled in the center of their property, which means um, they were landowners, right? And a landowning family had, um, of course, um, a lot of um, advantages, but also responsibilities. So the landowners of a specific estate were responsible for its adjacent tenants, um, the tenants' farms and neighborings, neighbors. These were social, civil, and legal obligations. So uh, rural power was very much concentrated on these land-owning families. So the land-owning family that owned property would be responsible for the, um, the farmers, the tenants um, in the adjacent areas of, of the estate. Um, and the Dashwoods had a very good reputation so as to engage the general good opinion of their surrounding acquaintance. So that's established. Dashwoods, very good family, good reputation, landowners. The late owner of this estate was a single man who lived to a very advanced age and who for many years of his life had a constant companion and housekeeper in his sister. But her death, which happened 10 years before his own, produced a great alteration in his home, for to supply her loss, he invited and received into his house the family of his nephew, Mr. Henry Dashwood, the legal inheritor of the Norland estate and the person to whom he intended to bequeath it. So now the late owner, so the owner who had already passed when the story begins, the late owner of this property had no children. Okay, so he has no children. Who does... Who inherits the property then? So you see that he also had a uh, sister, but that one died. So he brought into his family his nephew, Mr. Henry Dashwood, the legal inheritor. His nephew was the legal inheritor of the property because of um, the legal system at the time. Women were not allowed to inherit property, so all properties would be passed on to the closest male descendant. And in the case of the late owner of um, Norland Park, as a childless man, he would pass it on to his nephew, the closest male relative. In the society of his nephew and niece and their children, the old gentleman's way days were comfortably spent. His attachment to them all increased. The constant attention of Mr. and Mrs. Henry Dashwood to his wishes, which proceeded not merely from interest, but from goodness of heart, gave him every degree of solid comfort which his age could receive. And the cheerfulness of the children added a relish to his existence. So the nephew came with his wife and children, and they were very good to the old man, not only out of interest, because remember, he would inherit the, pro the property, but also from goodness of heart. The irony here in Jane Austen, right? Um, by a former marriage, Mr. Henry Dashwood had one son. By his present lady, three daughters. The son, a steady, respectable young man, was amply provided for by the fortune of his mother, which had been large and half of which devolved on him on his coming of age. 
By his own marriage, likewise, which happened soon afterwards, he added to his wealth. To him, therefore, the succession to the Norland estate was not so really important as to his sisters, for their fortune, independent of what might arise to them from their fathers inheriting that property, could be but small. Their mother had nothing, and their father only 7,000 pounds in his own disposal. For the remaining moiety of his first wife's fortune was also secured to her child, and he had only a life interest in it. So now Jane Austen is zooming in, right? So she begins with the um, Norland Park estate, the late owner who passed it on to his nephew. And the nephew um, was married twice. In his first marriage, he had a son, also called Henry Dashwood. And in his second marriage, he had three daughters. Now, according to the law, the state would pass on to the closest and oldest male relative, which is the first son. But he was already provided for. He had money from his own mother. He had money from his own um, marriage. So he did not need that. But his half-sisters, the three girls, would really need the money. Okay, let's see what happened then. The old gentleman died. His will was read and like almost every other will, gave as much disappointment as pleasure. He was neither so unjust nor so ungrateful as to leave his estate from his nephew, but he left it to him on such terms as destroyed half the value of the bequest. Mr. Dashwood had wished for it more for the sake of his wife and daughters than for himself or his son. But to his son and his son's son, a child of four years old, it was secured in such a way as to leave to himself no power of providing for those who were most dear to him and who most needed a provision by any charge on the state or by any sale of its valuable woods. The whole was tied up for the benefit of this child, who in occasional visits with his father and mother at Norland, had so far gained the affections of his uncle by such attractions as are by no means unusual in children of two or three years old. An imperfect articulation, an earnest desire of having his own way, many cunning tricks, and a great deal of noise as to outweigh all the value of all the attention which for years he had received from his niece and her daughters. He meant not to be unkind, however, and as a mark of his affection for the three girls, he left them a thousand pounds apiece. So what happened when the gentleman died is that um, he made a strict settlement. He passed on the, his fortune to his nephew, but with one condition, that his nephew would pass it on to his uh, male relatives, oldest relative, who would pass it on to his oldest uh, male relative. Um, so Mr. Henry Dashwood, the father, was very much concerned about the, the future of his three daughters because they had nothing and there was nothing he could do to change that because of the will and the strict settlement. Now, they were not left with nothing, okay? So each girl was left a thousand pounds apiece. What does it mean a thousand pounds apiece in 2023? Of course, the value of money changes. What is very interesting is a website called National Archives Currency Converter. If you Google that, you will, um, you will find it very easily. And on that website, you can put the year. So here, let's say, so Jane Austen first um, wrote this in the late 1790s, so let's say 1800. In 1800, how much was 1,000 pounds worth? And look at what I found. So 1,000 pounds in 1800 would be equivalent to 44,000 pounds in 2017. So that's quite a lot. Um, and with 1,000 pounds, one could buy 94, 95 horses, or 200 cows, or it was equivalent to the wages of 1,666 days of a skilled tradesman. 
So you see the social difference here, the social gap is huge. So for this upper middle class, or how to say that lower upper class, um, this would not be enough to live uh, comfortably or to, to secure a marriage because a woman with no um, estate would have to have a dowry, so money to secure a good marriage, which was the case of these three girls. Um, but still, that amount of money was not enough for them, but it was the amount of money that a skilled labor would um, get after working for 6,666 days. So that's huge inequality, right? So that's the situation, right? Okay, let's keep reading. Mr. Dashwood's disappointment was at first severe, but his temper was cheerful and sanguine, and he might reasonably hope to live many years, and by living economically, lay by a considerable sum from the produce of an estate already large and capable of almost immediate improvement. But the fortune, which had been so tardy in coming, was his only one, was his only one twelve month. He survived his uncle no longer, and ten thousand pounds, including the late legacies, was all that that remained for his widow and daughters. So he thought, let's save money. I will live long enough to save a lot of money for my daughters. But unfortunately, he died one year after that, and he could only. Um, accumulate 10,000 pounds for his daughters. Um, let's take a look at one of the footnotes here that I thought was interesting, page 437. Note. So here the editor writes that after the death of Reverend George Austin in 1805, so that's the father of Jane Austen, so she found herself in a similar situation to the Dashwood sisters. So after the death of the Reverend George Austin in 1805, Jane Austen, her sister Cassandra, and their mother possessed a comparable income, around 460 pounds a year. Austen's letters provide excellent witness to the domestic economies and sharp social exclusions attendant on this income when she and her mother and sister were living in Southampton and meeting new people. So this is a very good textual evidence of what it meant for this social class, what it meant to have, in this case, 460 pounds a year. Um, and this is a quote from one of the letters, right? They live in a handsome style and are rich, and she seemed to like to be rich. And we gave her to understand that we were far from being so, she will soon feel, therefore, that we are not worth her acquaintance. This is a letter written by Jane Austen herself. So um, when she was visiting acquaintances, she would realize how rich they were, but how that was far from her own situation after, after the death of her father, because her father, well, as it goes, women were not allowed to inherit property. And uh, George Austen and, her, and his wife, they had... Eight children, eight children, right? Eight children. So the money would pass on to the first, the oldest male relative, which was the oldest son, James. After James, there were other um, male relatives until Cassandra and then Jane Austen. So they would have pretty much nothing to live with except for the help they would receive from their uh, brothers, especially because they were not married. So um, they had no source of income except for what um, the father left them, which was very little, unfortunately. That was law. No property could be uh, passed on to women. And, um, and what their, bro their brothers helped them with. Okay, so now we are at um, the time when Mr. Dashwood is uh, feeling ill and we know that he died one year after his uncle. His son was sent for as soon as his danger was known, and to him Mr. Dashwood recommended, with all the strength and urgency which illness could command, the interest of his mother-in-law and sisters. In this case, mother-in-law means stepmother. 
Mr. John Dashwood had not the strong feelings of the rest of the family, but he was affected by a recommendation of such a nature at such a time, and he promised to do everything in his power to make them comfortable. His father was rendered easy by such an assurance, and Mr. John Dashwood, so John Dashwood is the son of Henry Dashwood, and Mr. John Dashwood had then leisure to consider how much there might prudently be in his power to do for them. So since there was nothing legally that Mr. Henry Dashwood could do to protect his three daughters, he asks his first son, John Dashwood, who would inherit everything, to promise him that he would take care of his uh, half-sisters. And he does promises, and he thinks how much there might prudently be in his power to help them. And there you go, the sarcastic Ironic Jane Austen again. What is prudent? What could he prudently do? So nothing that would sacrifice his own uh, future or his own comfort. But what could he do to make their situation better as long as it was considered prudent and appropriate? He was not an ill-disposed young man unless to be rather cold-hearted and rather selfish is to be ill-disposed. But he was in general well-respected for he conducted himself with propriety in the discharge of his ordinary duties. Propriety is something very important, right? Respectability, propriety. Had he married a more amiable woman, he might have been made still more respectable than he was. He might even have been made amiable himself, for he was very young when he married and very fond of his wife. But Mrs. John Dashwood was a strong caricature of himself, more narrow-minded and selfish. And there we go. Now we meet John Dashwood's wife, the selfish Mrs. John Dashwood, who is narrow-minded and even more selfish than John Dashwood. And she will play an important role in the lives of, um, not in the lives, but in the, um, in the future of the Dashwood sister. Um, and here there is a very interesting footnote. Let me check that, page 438. So he says, um, 15. So Austin uses the words, the phrase, more narrow-minded and selfish. And the editor found a very interesting intertextuality in these words. So narrow-minded and selfish. A situation and relationship described by Mary Wollstonecraft in a vindication of the rights of women in similar terms. So you may know that uh, Mary Wollstonecraft is considered to be the first feminist in English language or in England. And she was the mother of none other than Mary Shelley. And she was the wife of none other than uh, uh, William Godwin. So, um, And she wrote about how women should have equal rights to education as men. And she writes in The Vindication of the Rights of Women the following. The wife, a cold-hearted, narrow-minded woman, is jealous of the title of the little kindness which her husband shows to his relations and is displeased at seeing the property of her children lavished on an helpless sister. So you see that Jane Austen uses the exact same phrase that Wollstonecraft did here, narrow-minded and selfish, describing the same situation. So here Mrs. John Dashwood is very displeased at the possibility of seeing her property, which is not even hers, but her husband's, of her property uh, being uh, uh, in danger uh, that her own son would not uh, inherit it, but a helpless sister in this case. John Dashwood's sisters. Okay. When he gave his promise to his father, he meditated within himself to increase the fortunes of his sisters by the present of a thousand pounds apiece, which would double their income. He then really thought himself equal to it. The prospect of four thousand a year in addition to his present income, besides the remaining half of his own mother's fortune, warmed his heart and made him feel capable of generosity. Yes, he would give them £3,000. It will be liberal and handsome. It will be enough to make them completely easy. £3,000. He could spare so considerable a sum with little inconvenience. He thought of it all day long and for many days successfully, and he did not repent. 
So he had made his decision. No sooner was his father's funeral over than Mrs. John Dashwood, without sending any notice of her intention to her mother-in-law, arrived with her child and their attendants. No one could dispute her right to come. The house was her husband's from the moment of his father's decease. But the indelicacy of her conduct was so much the greater, and to a woman in Mrs. Dashwood's situation, with only common feelings, must have been highly unpleasing. But in her mind, there was a sense of honor so keen, a generosity so romantic, that any offense of the kind, by whomsoever given or received, was to her a source of immovable disgust. So imagine the situation. The, the father has just died. The funeral is just over. And the, um, the wife of the son of the first marriage comes to the house saying it's her right to be there and that the others should leave without any warning. She takes over the house. Mrs. John Dashwood had never been a favorite with any of her husband's family, but she had had no opportunity till the present of showing them with how little attention to the comfort of other people she could act when occasion required it. So acutely did Mrs. Dashwood feel this ungracious behavior, and so earnestly did she despise her daughter-in-law for it, that on the arrival of the letter she would have quitted the house forever had not the entreaty of her eldest girl induced her first to reflect on the propriety of going, again the word propriety, and her own tender love for all her three children determined her afterwards to stay, and for their sakes avoid a breach with their brother. And now we have a glimpse into one of the Dashwood girls, the eldest, who entreats her mom to stay, not to cause any, um, any friction with her brother, that could be very harmful to them, and to think. So that's the eldest, Eleanor. And now we have a description of Eleanor. Eleanor, this eldest daughter whose advice was so effectual, possessed a strength of understanding and coolness of judgment which qualified her, though only 19, to be the counselor of her mother and enabled her frequently to counteract, to the advantage of them all, that eagerness of mind in Mrs. Dashwood, which must generally have led to imprudence. She had an excellent heart, her disposition was affectionate, and her feelings were strong, but she knew how to govern them. It was a knowledge which her mother had yet to learn, and which one of her sisters had resolved never to be taught. So Eleanor is the sensible one is the one who knows how to govern her feelings, how to think before action, which is very different from her mother and from her other sister, Marianne. Let's look at Marianne's description. Marianne's abilities were, in many respects, quite equal to Eleanor's. She was sensible and clever, but eager in everything. Her sorrows, her joys could have no moderation. She was gener generous, amiable, interesting. She was everything but prudent. The resemblance between her and her mother was strikingly great. So Mar Marianne is the opposite of Eleanor. While Eleanor is sense, brain, prudence, thinking, Marianne is feelings, drama, overreacting, no moderation, just like her mother. Eleanor saw with, con with concern the excess of her sister's sensibility, but um, by Mrs. Dashwood it was valued and cherished. They encourage each other now in the violence of their affection, affliction. The agony of grief which overpowered them at first was voluntarily renewed, was sought for, was created again and again. They gave themselves up wholly to their sorrow, seeking increase of wretchedness in every reflection that could afford it, and resolved against ever admitting consolation in future. Eleanor, too, was deeply afflicted, but still she could struggle, she could exert herself, she could consult with her brother, could receive her sister-in-law on her arrival, and treat her with proper attention, and could strive to rouse her mother to similar exertion and encourage her to similar forbearance. So you see how 
right now, the title of the novel is pretty clear, Sense and Sensibility, meaning the two sisters. Sense is, well, let's say that Eleanor is the embodiment of sense, whereas Marianne is the embodiment of sensibility. Margaret, the third sister, the other sister, was a good-humored, well-disposed girl, but as she had already imbibed a good deal of Marianne's romance without having much of her sense, she did not, at 13, bid fair to equal her sisters at a more advanced period of life. And this is the end of chapter one. So uh, we learn a lot from chapter one, uh, things that are very important to set the scene, the characters. So we are, as readers, introduced to the characters, Marianne and Eleanor, and the other sister, Margaret, but also Mrs. Dashwood, her husband, Mr. Dashwood, who died and had to uh, pass on his property to his oldest male relative, who was John Dashwood, the son of his first marriage. And he could not, um, so Henry Dashwood could not secure um a good, um, sorry, a good future for um, his daughters, unfortunately. Uh, so they would have to rely on the um, goodness of heart of their half-brother, which was going well until his wife arrived and she takes control of the house and she will change the way that John Dashwood thinks. Um, we also learn about the importance of reputation and respectability in Georgian England. If you lose respectability, you lose everything. You are ostracized. You have no place in society. And it's the end. It's your end. Socially, financially, everything. Um, we've talked about the strict settlement by entailment, which means, which is what, uh, in fact, uh, Henry Dashwood's uncle did, which he passes on the, um, the property to his male relative with the condition that he would only pass it, he would pass it on to his male descendant and would not even use the income or part of the property um, or the land or the um, um, the wood or any of the um, production made on that land for the benefit of other people. And now we understand the importance of marriage for women at the time. So it was not only a matter of the heart, it was barely a matter of the heart. It was more a matter of practicality, of survival. So look at the, the fate of um, Eleanor, Marion, and Margaret. They have nothing. They could inherit nothing from their fathers. Their mother has also very little. So what future do they have? What they need is to secure a good marriage so then they could rely on their husbands and luckily have um, sons who would inherit their father's property and then could help the mother in a, in a later, in an older age. Um, so you see how important it is for Austin characters to marry. Take a look at exam. Uh, take, an ex take a look at, for example, Elizabeth Bennet in Pride and Prejudice and Charlotte Lucas in Pride and Prejudice. So Elizabeth believes in marriage as um, a union of souls, as a matter of the heart. But Charlotte Lucas, who is twenty-seven, if I'm not mistaken, so pretty old at that time. So at the verge of spinsterhood, at the verge of becoming ostracized by society, at the verge of being, um, of worrying about money her whole life, she sees uh, marriage in a different way. Um, so it's not a matter of the heart, it's a matter of survival, of securing herself a comfort home, a comfort, uh, comfortable uh, future. Um, so here we are. So we finished chapter one. I hope you enjoyed this introduction to sense and sensibility, um, to understanding the characters, the introduction to the characters. And we'll meet again next week for our second session in which we'll discuss chapters two to five. We're going to read them together and comment some uh, parts. You can read them in advance or read them with me um, 
life. Um, thank you so much for being here today, those of you that are uh, watching it live, and also for those of you who watch the recording. Um, don't forget to um, check out the website booksandculture.club to see what I have been creating for you, and I will see you next week. Have a great and lovely week.